Welcome to Bridge Online. My name is Daniel and I serve on the team here at The Bridge. I hope that as you join us for service this morning, you feel right at home. Here at The Bridge, we're all on a journey to be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. So today, as we dive into a time of God's word together, we pray that it is a blessing to you and encourages us all to abide with and be transformed by Christ today and every day. If you're joining us for the first time, I'm so glad you're here. Would you let us know you're here by doing one quick thing and dropping a waving emoji in the chat? One of our online hosts would love to say hey and get you connected. And if you're not joining us for the first time this week, and maybe you call the bridge home, can you help me welcome everyone who is joining us for the first time this week by giving them a big bridge welcome and helping them make connections right here on the stream. Then make sure to share the stream because we don't want anyone to do church alone this morning and you never know who could join and be a part of this experience with us. All right, it's time to get started. As we head into this time of worship together, I'd encourage you to make your living room, your bedroom, office, wherever you're at, a sanctuary where you can be fully present with God this morning. Set aside any distractions, get a copy of God's Word ready, and maybe even get a pen and notebook so you can take notes as you go. But also, we're not doing this alone. So at any time, drop in the chat when something is encouraging to you or stands out, because we're here to do this together and be on the journey of being with and becoming like Jesus with one another. On that note, let's dive into worship.
That's my shepherd, my protector. That's my king. That's my rock. That's my anchor. so good. You are worthy of all of our praise, all of our worship, Jesus. Only you will satisfy. Lord, we turn our eyes on you this morning.
were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one and cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified Church, sing out, join with creation. Come on, we're singing. Christ be magnified. Let His praise rise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be. start the day repenting of our idols and our flesh and confessing and making this our declaration so let's sing this out with confidence i won't bow come on i won't bow to idols i'll stand strong and worship you and if he puts me in the fire i'll rejoice because you're there too i won't be formed by feelings i'll hold fast to what is true Cause if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway Into resurrection life And if I join you in the sufferings Then I'll join you
longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This verse reminds us that we are not alone, that Christ dwells with us, and it is because of his unrelenting grace that we have power and strength for today, and we have a sure hope for tomorrow. Yeah. Let's pray. Jesus, would you be magnified in all that we do and all that we say this morning? We are so grateful for your strength, for your power, for your joy, for your hope that dwells in us and it is because of you that we are able to gather this morning and it is because of your grace that we are here <laughs> and that we are forgiven and we are just so grateful. We love you and are just so thankful you love us so much more. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church family, it is so good to be here with you this morning. For all of you joining us in person and to those of you joining us online, welcome to church. Before you find your seat, go ahead and say hi to a few people around you. Maybe find someone you've never met before and introduce yourself. to church this morning. If we have never had the opportunity to meet, my name is Hannah and I am a part of our team here at the bridge and it is a joy to be gathered with you this morning. And hey, if it's your very first time here at the bridge, I just want to say welcome. I hope that you are finding yourself at home already. And I also hope you swung by our first time guest tent on your way in. But if you happen to miss it, after service, I will be hanging out in what we call the living room. It's this area of couches right here in the back of the auditorium. And I would love to meet you, to get to know you, learn your name, answer any question you might have about the bridge. So come stop by after service in the living room. And I'm excited to tell you about something we've got coming up here at the bridge. It's called Open House. And so if you're new around here, you want to listen up. The Open House is incredible. It's an awesome opportunity for you to get a peek behind the curtain to all of the things about the bridge. It's a way for you to get connected with one another, to learn about our mission, our vision, our values. It really is awesome. And we'd love for you to come to Open House. It's on July 10th. It's after our 1130 service. And we've got food. We've got child care. We've got you covered. All you have to do is show up and we would again love to see you there. And speaking of getting connected, one of the best ways to stay connected to all the things happening here at the bridge throughout the week is through our digital connect card. And so if you pull out your phone, you can go to bridge.tv slash next. And there you can leave your information, any comments, questions, prayer requests you might have. And we will have someone from our team reach out to you. Well, y'all, this past week was exciting in the life of our church. Our bridge kids went to camp for the very first time. <laughs> yeah, it was a whole lot of fun, as you can see from these pictures behind me. Um, but more than that, these kids grew in their relationship with Jesus as they learned about the wonder of God. I had the opportunity to go and visit camp for a day this week, and I was truly amazed. I was amazed at how much energy all of these kids had. I was also amazed at how much sugar they decided to eat without their parents around. <laughs> But more than that, I was amazed at watching them pray and worship and grow in their relationship with Jesus. One little girl shared that she has known that there was God, but she didn't know that God was for her, that God cared for her, that God knew her. And she was one of our bridge kids that made a decision to follow Jesus. Yes, this is really exciting. And so if we had one prayer for this next generation, it would be that they would experience God in a new way and through opportunities like this, that their foundation would be built on Jesus and Jesus alone. And as they grow into adulthood, that they would have a sure foundation in him. 
Well, in just a minute, we're going to get a tiny glimpse into all of the fun in Bridge Kids Camp that happened there. But before we do, we always want to take time to give back to God every time we gather. It's an opportunity for us to worship Him. And in light of what's happening in our nation and in our culture, this really is an opportunity for us as a church to show and model the generosity that Jesus has shown us. And so this morning, in light of the decisions with Roe versus Wade, everything given in person, yeah, <laughs> everything given in person and online this morning is going directly to some of our nonprofit partnerships that serve and help and support vulnerable women and children, organizations, yeah. Organizations like 431 Ministries and the pregnancy centers of Middle Tennessee that are truly doing incredible work to support these women and families. And so again, everything given in person and online will be given directly to them. If you call the Bridge Your Home, you'll see ways that you can give on the screen, including how you can give to women advocacy. And we don't wanna just be a church that sits back we want to be a church that loves and shows the love of Jesus to our community. So this is an incredible opportunity that we have to do that. So in just a minute, the buckets will come forward. You're welcome to place your gifts in there. And as I invite our team to come up to pass those, we can turn toward the screens and check out Bridge Kids Camp. Are we on? Are we on? Okay. I think there was supposed to be a bumper, but we're just going to jump right in. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Um, hey, greetings to those of you here uh, in Spring Hill and those of you watching online and at our Columbia campus. Great to be with you guys this morning. You have no idea who I am. Um, so uh, hold the applause until you get to know me a little better. Um, my name is Corey. I am originally from Oregon State, born and raised in Salem, uh, Oregon, and I moved out to the Chicago area to go to school, and then I stuck around there, and that's how I know your lovely pastor, Ian Simpkins. Uh, so uh, I am, it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. I'm really excited to, to join you. I would love to introduce you to my family uh, here. There are five, there we are, okay, all right. We'll start with this lovely lady. Her name is Kasia. She is my wife. Uh, we got married at the ripe old age of 20. And uh, so she was my roommate in college for the last two years. And uh, she grew up in a missionary family. So she was raised primarily in Hungary and Romania. Uh, ooh, yeah, so she's way more interesting than I am. Um, <laughs> And then we took seriously that command to be fruitful and multiply. So these are uh, our boys here. This is Keller, our oldest. Uh, he's seven years old. Keller says the best things. Okay, so uh, the other day he said, Dad, do you know what my greatest weakness is? I said, I said, what? He said, being tickled under my armpits. I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, that and being stabbed with knives. <laughs> It's not wrong. Uh, over here is our middle son, Elin. 
Elin is about five, and he's our special needs kiddo and brings a ton of joy to our lives. And this little nugget here is Rowan. He is about a year and a half, and he keeps us on our toes in all sorts of ways. The other morning, we woke up to a loud noise and a bad smell. Not the best way to start the day. Uh, we walked into his room, and he decided to uh, poop in his diaper, which is fine. We allow that. Uh, but then he decided that his diaper needed to come off, uh, and then he put his blossoming artistic skills to use by painting the inside of his crib with his own feces. So uh, that was the start of our day. It's one of those mornings you wake up and you're like, do we have enough coffee in the house? Is this... So we're very functional, uh, not a lot of sleep in our house, but lots of joy. Uh, and just a pleasure to be with you guys. Thanks for being welcoming. Uh, love, uh, this is my third time here at the Bridge Church, and love teaching God's Word. Honored to be with you guys. Uh, before we jump in, would you take a moment and pray with me? God, we thank you so much for uh, your love and your kindness to us. Uh, we thank you that you draw near to us, you chase after us even when we wander, and you speak to us, and you delight in speaking to us. And so today, as we open up your word, God, I pray that we would encounter your love and your grace, that we'd be challenged in all the right ways, and that we'd walk away different, uh, maybe looking a little bit more like Jesus as a result of what we encounter today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to start off with a game, all right? The game is very simple. It's called Caption This. This is participatory. So uh, those of you here in the room, Columbia, I want to hear you guys. Simply shout out what you see on the screen. Very simple, okay? So first, first image here. What do you see? Rabbit. Duck. Rabbit. Seagull. Oh, a seagull, okay. All right, duck, duck, rabbit. Okay, how about this next one? What do you see? An old lady? A young woman? Is this, her, is this a nose or a chin? That'll determine it for you. There, okay. All right, next image. Is he looking forward or is he turned to the side? Some of your brains are bending right now in half. <laughs> okay. All right, last one. Here we go. Shout it out. What do you see? Horse. Frog. Raise your hand if you see a frog. Raise your hand if you do not see a frog. All right, there we go. All right, calm down. Okay, <laughs> here's my question for you. What's the caption, what's the caption you've written under your life today? What's the caption you've written under your life today? Uh, often when we experience really hard things in life, difficult situations, we experience pain. That pain can be the first thing that we see and then it's the only thing that we see. Maybe uh, you are in a season of pain right now and uh, pain is the caption you've written under the season. Maybe it's so bad you've determined that pain is the caption under your whole life. And once you caption your life, sometimes it's hard to uncaption it and see something different, okay? But maybe you've met somebody who's challenged your perception. Maybe you've met somebody who's gone through really hard things and you're pretty sure you know what the caption should be under their life. It should be pitiable or miserable, but then you get to talking with them and they have a very different caption under their life. The caption under their life is something like grateful or hopeful. And you have a moment where you're like, are, you, are we looking at different things? You're saying horse and I'm saying frog. Like what, what is it that you're seeing that I'm not? Are you pretending or is there actually something that I'm not seeing that you are tuned into? The call of the follower of Jesus is not to look away from hardship but rather to look at it fully and to keep looking at it until, by God's grace, that brokenness that we saw when the image first flashed up on the screen of our lives, that gets absorbed into something more complex, more counter counterintuitive, and maybe even more beautiful than we saw at first glance. Today we're continuing our teaching series, Long Story Short, and I want to give you the big idea for where we're headed today, okay? Give you some handlebars. Here's the big idea. When a glance shows hardship, gaze. Gaze until you see hope. 
We're going to look at the Old Testament book of Ruth. If you've got a Bible with you, you can begin turning there now. <clears throat> uh, Ruth is one of the shortest books in the Old Testament, and it is one of only two bearing the name of a woman. What I find really interesting about the book of Ruth is it starts with a woman. The story ends with a woman. This woman is named more than any other character in the story, and that woman is not Ruth. It's actually her mother-in-law, Naomi. So you could almost make the argument that this could be a story, a book called Naomi. Naomi's story is messy. It is complicated. It is full of twists and turns. And as I've studied it, I have found it challenging and I found it to be hope-filled. And my hope for you and us here today is that you would find it challenging and that you would find it hope-filled as we dive in. There are four chapters in the book of Ruth, and we are going to look at four ways in which we can let Naomi's story shape our story. We're going to dive through a bunch of scripture today. Are you okay with that? We're just, going to, we're just going to truck on through. So buckle up. We're going to start right at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1. Here we go. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Okay, time out. Lots here in the first verse by way of context. If you know your Bible well, you know this is the time of judges. This is not a good time. This is a time of chaos. This is a time of rebellion. This is where we get the phrase, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Not a good time. Add to that a famine. A famine has hit the land. Lots of chaos and instability now. And then we're introduced right here in the first verse to a family who, in search of food, goes to a neighboring country. Well, I think that's all, all that bad. But the country they go to is Moab. And again, if you have, uh, you know, the original hearers, they, they would have an antenna up for the name Moab. It was not a good place. Ancient enemy of God's people. This was not a place that you would go if you could at all avoid it. And that's where they go. Verse 2. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. Fun fact, this is where we get the, uh, the name Oprah. Oprah's mom saw the story, liked it, wanted to name her Orpah, misspelled it, and there we have Oprah, okay? <laughs> Totally useless fact, okay? Uh, more to the point here, what do, what do they do when they move into this land? They, they don't just settle down and get some food for a while. They begin settling down and starting families, taking wives. And taking the wives of foreigners, especially in a country like Moab, strictly forbidden. They're not just interested in food. They're starting a life in this place, okay? Again, alarm bells would be going off. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Killian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud. And they said to her, we'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait? Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. 
So the two women went until they came to Bethlehem. Here's what I want us to see from the first part of our story. In the midst of pain, look for friendship. Look for friendship. Naomi is a woman who has experienced legitimate pain. She has lost a lot. This is a terrible way for a story to start. She has a famine, displacement from her land. She's living as a refugee amongst a people who've been enemies of Israel. And then she lost her husband. And then she lost two sons. Then she hears that the famine in Judah has ended. And this means she has two options. She can either stay as a widow and as a foreigner in Moab, or she can return back to Judah. But if she goes back, she is entitled to nothing that her husbands or her sons would have had, uh, been entitled to. As a woman, she would lost all of it. Neither are great options, but she decides, Bethlehem is my hometown. I'm going to go back to there. And so her two daughters-in-law say, well, we'll go with you. She says, no. But they keep pushing. And they say, no, we, we mean it. We'll go with you. But Naomi puts her foot down, right? She, she says, you guys need to stay here because this is where you have the best chance at getting a new start to your life. Get married again. Start over without me. So after Naomi makes her case, Orpah, her, the first daughter-in-law, she obeys Naomi. She turns around and goes. But then there's Ruth. And Ruth stays. And after a third attempt from Naomi to get her to go with her sister, Ruth refuses to go back. She says, look, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going to let you go back alone. I'm here with you now, and that's not going to change. Ruth draws near to Naomi despite the fact that Naomi is pushing her away. Ruth knows that Naomi is in pain, and she's willing to stay there through it. Ruth is a good friend. Ruth is on to something here too. You and I, friends, are not meant to be alone and we certainly aren't meant to suffer alone. Sometimes we go through really hard times and and maybe we've lost people close to us, whether they have left us or they have died and we tend to sometimes think, maybe it's better if I just do life alone. That thought can begin to creep in. But from the beginning, what has God said? It is not good that we are alone. I would say except for the decision that you make to follow Jesus, maybe the most important thing about you is who you surround yourself with. Your friendships or your lack of friendships will shape you in profound ways. And friendship is a foundation that is best laid before life hits the fan, before tragedy strikes, before the pain sets in. Naomi's story depicts a truth that we all know well, that pain in life is inevitable. It's inevitable. So what does that mean for our friendships? Some of you are in a season of pain right now, and maybe what you need most is to open your eyes to friends who are still standing by you through it. The Ruths who have refused to go anywhere, even though things in your life have gotten pretty messy. Think about it. Who in your life, by simply being a friend, continued presence, has demonstrated to you that they think that you are worth the mess? Others of you are in a season of stability right now. Things are going okay. You're not in a really painful situation, but maybe you're new to the area. Maybe you're still getting settled and the job is going well and things are going okay, but you have not yet let yourself be known by the people in this community, not gotten to know people in this community, and it's time for you to begin laying that foundation of friendship before life hits the fan, because it will inevitably. One of the best ways to do that is through a bridge group. Jump into a community. Do life with the people here in this church family. You can get on the website, join a group today. Others of you are in a season where you have an opportunity to be a Ruth to a Naomi. Uh, to be a determined friend to somebody who's suffering, even though they might be pushing you away. Naomi lost her blood family. She lost her husband and her two sons. And Ruth chose to be family to Naomi, even, she, even though she could have cut ties and walked away. Some of you have an opportunity to be a friend to somebody who, and, and say, you're hurting and thank you for the offer, but no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere because I love you and I think you are worth it. That's what the church should be. And that's the kind of conviction that when we live that out, we'll make the church and we'll make this church an irresistible place to a watching world. In the midst of pain, look for friendship. Picking up at verse 19, part two of our story. 
So the two women went out until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. I uh, wrote most of this message from a pediatric room in a hospital. I was there for or earlier this month for a full week with our middle son, Elon. It wasn't the first time we spent a week in the hospital with Elon, and it probably won't be the last. Uh, Elon was born in late 2017, and uh, shortly after birth was diagnosed with a rare brain malformation. It's a genetic defect. In fact, it's so rare that there are only like two or three other known cases of it in the world. And his particular brain malformation has made his life really hard and really complicated in all sorts of ways. Like Elon cannot see. He's blind. He cannot talk or walk or really even move. He can't even roll over on his own. And he has daily seizures and a series of seizures within the first few months of his life took away his ability to swallow. And so he feeds through a G-tube in his stomach. When you plan out your family life, you have kids and you imagine what it's going to be like to watch them grow up, you don't imagine one of your kids having to eat through a hole in his stomach. When we got Elin's diagnosis, it was like a bomb went off in our life. And we were just like left scrambling to pick up the pieces. And, and, and as we were picking up the pieces, it was really painful. Not, not just to deal with the acute stuff, but thinking long-term for Elin. We had to digest all of that in a short amount of time. And it's been a struggle every day since then as well. And, and that struggle, that pain, is constantly tempting me and us to a place of bitterness. And sometimes I've given myself over to bitterness. I've let bitterness have a field day with my heart and my mind. And some of you know this, who experience pain and, and that watch that pain morph into bitterness and watch that bitterness get a foothold in your life. You know that it has the power not to just discolor part of your life, but really to discolor all of your life after a while. At the end of chapter one, we see that Naomi's pain kind of culminates. It's legitimate pain, right? She has lost a lot. But here's also where we see the danger of unmanaged pain. She is bitter. In fact, she's so bitter that she's declared a, a change to her name. She says, I'm no longer Naomi. Naomi means sweet. Mara literally means bitter. Naomi is no longer somebody who just has pain. Naomi has become her pain. Some of you here have experienced deep, legitimate pain. Maybe you're going through it right now. Maybe you came to this area for a romantic relationship, a boyfriend, girlfriend, they lived here, and so you came, and then guess what? They broke up with you, and now what? Now, some of you have been struggling a long time, maybe quietly, with infertility, miscarriage, you're watching people around you seemingly have joyful time, a joyful time having kids and starting families. That's a painful thing. Some of you have uh, been trying to buy a home for a long time, and you thought, 2020, it's my year. <laughs> 2021, fresh start. And, and 20, it's like not happening, right? And you, and you feel like your life is stalled out. Some of you have raised a child, sent them on their way off to college or to start a job. You thought maybe things were going pretty well. And then they have veered hard and they're making decisions that are breaking your heart. Some of you have been wounded or betrayed by somebody really close to you. Maybe a friend you've had for a long time. Maybe somebody in your own house. Maybe your husband, your wife. There's a good chance, no matter where you're at, there's a part of your life that's painful, really painful. But for some of you, what's true of Naomi is also true of you, that your pain has gone from being in your life to defining your life. 
Naomi was sent into a tailspin because of the story she was telling about her life. Upon returning to Bethlehem, she says, the Almighty has made my life bitter. She says, I went away full. Now, is that true? It was a famine. She literally left town because she was hungry. And she says, and I came back empty. Now, can you imagine being Ruth standing next to Naomi as she says that? Leaving your country, being a foreigner and a widow to go with a woman that you care about and to have her enter town and tell the women of the town, I am empty. I have nothing. This is somebody who succumbed to bitterness. Chapter two, verse one. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who is from the clan of Elimelech. Middle of chapter two, we find Naomi or Ruth goes out to the field. She meets Boaz and Boaz sees her and is kind to her. He tells the men of the field, don't touch her. She, she's, she's a Moabite, a widow. She's alone. He's protecting her. He gives her food to eat, gives her lunch, and then he sends her home with as much grain as she can carry. Right? Then picking up at 19, her mother-in-law, she returns home, Naomi, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she'd been working. The man of, uh, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. And we'll get to that in just a second. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in somebody else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Here's what I want us to get from the second part of the story. In the midst of bitterness, look for blessing. In the midst of bitterness, look for blessing. Ruth goes and she returns from a day out in the field and she's full of food. She's got lots of food. And this is the point in the story where we finally see Naomi's heart begin to shift, soften as she turns away from bitterness. And what breaks her heart away from bitterness, ready, is recognizing blessing in her life. Companionship. She sees Ruth. Food on the table. Protection offered by somebody who is kind. Naomi has suffered. Her pain is legitimate. But up until now, it has crowded out any ability for her to see that things in her life are not as bad as they could be. Some of you are tempted to say with Naomi today, God has afflicted me. I used to be full and now I'm empty. And I just want to like lovingly push back on that today and say, you are not empty. There are things in your life that people in this room right now would do anything to have. You are not empty. It's just hard to see those blessings when bitterness crowds them out. So what do we do when bitterness gives birth or brokenness gives birth to bitterness in our life and that begins to crowd that out? What do we do? We simply cultivate gratitude. It's one of the simplest things that you could do. It costs nothing. Cultivate gratitude. Gratitude is simply having the eyes to see the things in, the, in your life that are good and the heart to say, this is a blessing. Okay, really important caveat though. The purpose of blessing is not to minimize your pain. The purpose of blessing is simply to not let your pain minimize your blessings. I'm gonna say that one more time because it's really important. The purpose of gratitude is not to minimize your pain. The purpose of gratitude is to not let your pain minimize your blessings. Gratitude has incredible power. There's been studies uh, done that have shown the effects that it has in our life. Uh, gratitude reduces depression and stress. Gratitude increases self-reported happiness about your entire life. Gratitude can enhance recovery from addiction. And it can even lower blood pressure, help you sleep better, and even increase your life expectancy. 
I read about this a few years ago, and I'm like, I got to get on that train. And so I started doing something very simple every day. I, I send a, a gratitude text message to somebody in my life. It takes me 60 seconds. I say, I'm grateful for you because of this, something specific. And, and it changed my life. You should try it. Give it a week. See what it does to your life. When I am grateful, I begin to see with, with uh, new eyes, fresh eyes, how God sees my life. I have the same eyes that God sees my life with. And that, that'll change things for you. So one small example. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I began losing my hair. 19 years old. You think that made me bitter? Yeah. yeah. As we say in the Midwest, you betcha. Okay, it, it made me bitter. Okay. But I did what, I, what many of us do uh, when we get sad. I, I opened my Bible, turned right to Leviticus, okay? And <laughs> there, there in chapter, verse 13, chapter 13, uh, the Lord spoke to me in a way that I can't deny. He said, the man who has lost his hair and is bald is clean. Praise God for that, right? <laughs> That's like a life verse. I've got that stitched on a pillow somewhere, <laughs> right? Gratitude is Powerful. Gratitude is the opposite of bitterness. In fact, you might even say that gratitude is an antidote to bitterness. By the end of cha the chapter, Naomi has begun to rewrite the caption that she had written on, under this season of her life. She's come to the point of saying, it's not all bitter after all. She's beginning to taste the sweetness of grace, and even in the midst of difficulty. And this launches her into a, a season with newfound energy. We pick it up in chapter 3. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you'll be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes, then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him, uh, don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. I'll do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. Here's the point of this section. In the midst of difficulty, look for opportunity. Look for opportunity. Ruth and Naomi are now at a place in their life where they're stabilized, but they're, in a, they're stuck in a cycle of gleaning, trying to get food here and there. They're still vulnerable. It's not a sustainable way to live. Uh, Naomi recognizes that, and she says, there's an opportunity before us, and she takes initiative. So remember back to that thing that Naomi said about Boaz in the last chapter. She knows that he is what's called a guardian redeemer, or some translations would say a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer was a practice in ancient Israel, whereby if somebody's life hit the fan, that they would, there's a sort of safety net there. Uh, they they would, wouldn't be left alone. They wouldn't be left in, in danger or destitute. A male relative could come and redeem them. This could mean paying off debt that they had accrued. This could mean buying back land that they were forced to sell to make, make ends meet, to keep that land in their family. And sometimes it meant marrying somebody whose husband died so that their family line could continue. And Naomi recognizes Boaz as one of these guys. He is a wealthy relative, and if he is willing, then he could marry Ruth. He could restore our family line, the family line of Elimelech. We could get our family land back and maybe, just maybe, give Ruth a shot again at being a mom. Boaz is uniquely positioned to help them get out of their cycle of poverty and to start a new life. But Naomi knows this isn't just going to happen on its own, so she takes initiative. This renewed Naomi kicks it into gear, and she becomes Ruth's coach. And what she says is fantastic. I love this. This is what she says. She says, wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes and go. Now, we read that in the NIV translation, um, but scholars kind of put their heads together, and they believe that the most literal best way to, tr uh, to translate this is just, <laughs> get it, girl, okay? And get after it, all right? I don't, I don't want you to, you to say after today that, that the Old Testament isn't relevant because right here in Ruth chapter 3 is maybe the best dating advice you will ever get, right? She says, shower, put on some good smells, put on some nice clothes, and get after it, okay? Now, I'll be the first to say that the gospel is not good, advi good advice. It is good news, right? The gospel is not clean yourself up. The, the cleaning yourself up will not save you. All I'm saying is it will not hurt you, okay? Uh, so so putting on your best clothes won't get you into heaven. It just might get you a first date. That's, that's all I'm saying, okay? 
Some of you, some of you feel stuck in life right now and, and you're bitter and you, all you see is the obstacle. You don't have eyes to see what is an opportunity around you. So some of you have lost a job recently. That's really painful. Things feel really unstable right now. But is there an opportunity for you to reassess and say, God, how might you be calling me to use my God-given talents differently in my work, right? Some of you are newly single, not by your choice. Or maybe you're an empty nester, right? You have raised your kids and now they're off. There's a certain void in your life. And we tend to want to just fill that void real quick with something else that's going to overpromise and underdeliver. But is God calling you to maybe use the season of increased bandwidth to serve a new capacity? It's unfortunate. I asked Ian, I said, is there anywhere I could direct people to serve? He said, all of our serving slots are full. We don't need any more volunteers. <laughs> now, of course, that's not true. There's always needs, right? Jump in, serve in the, in the, in the kids' ministry. So jump into a ministry team and serve. Do you have bandwidth? Serve. Uh, some of you have uh, a recent injury or illness that has sat you down stopped you from doing the things you really wanted to be doing right now? Maybe it slowed you down. Is there an opportunity for you right now to dwell in this season and not get caught up in the frantic and frenzy and hurry that our culture is obsessed with for you to take a breather and make time for the things that really matter? Maybe you have an investment that you've made. It's gone bad. You've lost a lot of money recently. It's an opportunity for you to rehearse to yourself, I am not defined by what I earn. And this is not just positive, hollow thinking. Uh, if we actually believe, friends, that God is working in all things for our good, then looking for opportunity in the midst of hardship, it's not glossing over. It's not pretending. It's a prayerful posture of your heart saying, God, help me to see my situation with your eyes. It's as simple as that. By the end of the chapter, Boaz finds himself attracted to Ruth in both appearance and in character. He acknowledges, yes, I'm a candidate to be a kinsman redeemer for you. There's just one problem, one hiccup. There's a man ahead of me in line. Somebody who is first, gets first dibs on this situation. He needs to be asked first. So Ruth goes home to Naomi. Chapter three ends on sort of a cliffhanger, but for the first time, there is hope in this house. And for the first time, there's hope in Naomi's heart. But this required something of her. It required her to shake the notion that God had written off her story, and it required her to recognize an opportunity and seize it. In the midst of difficulty, look for opportunity. Long story short, in the fourth and final chapter, it starts by, by Boaz going and getting that man who was first in line. He brings him to the city gates where decisions are made. He ga gathers the town elders to be witnesses. He says, here's the opportunity. And the man says, no, that would be inconvenient for my agenda. Thank you very much. I'll pass. Then verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he, became, may he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms she cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. In the midst of death in your life, friends, look for new life. As I sat at the end of my son's hospital bed earlier this month, I was reflecting on just how much time my wife and I have spent in the hospital over the last few years since he was born. And the most recent uh, stay in the intensive care unit, it was by no means pleasant, but it was not nearly as bad as in September where we were there for a week with him. And despite the best that medic medicine could offer, his life hung in the balance for several days as we waited and held our breath. And as I was loading up Elin into our van this most recent time, I was struck by the reality that apart from a miracle, there will likely be a day where we take Elin to the hospital 
and we have to come home without him. My wife and I had had to think a lot about death in the last few years. And what that meant, has meant for us is that we have been forced to cast ourselves on the promises of God. If there is no gospel, then Elon's story is just a tragedy. It's, and so is my story, and so, and so is your story. But if it is true that the tomb is empty, that death has lost its sting, that resurrection reigns, and that Jesus is coming again to wipe every tear from every eye and usher in a new age where everything sad will come untrue, then friends, we can have hope. We can see past death, even death, to new life. And for my family, for my family, what that means is when Elon is in the age to come and when he gets a new brain and he will have new eyes to see, he will be able to sing and dance and worship. And for us, we know that the first time he opens those new eyes of his, the face that he will see, the first face that he will see is the face of Jesus. Yes. And that is, that is our anchor. That is our hope. That is what allows us to see past death because we know that on the other side of death, there is the hope of new life. At the beginning of the book of Ruth, Naomi is faced with death. And the story ends with a birth, a baby boy who is a miracle to Naomi. And because of this baby, a thousand years after Naomi, another baby boy from this family line would be born in this very town, this little town of Bethlehem, and his name would be Jesus, which means God saves, and he too would be a kinsman redeemer. See, putting on flesh, Jesus became family to us. He became one of us to us. He became our kinsman, and being fully God, he used the riches at his disposal to redeem us. But for you to see Jesus as your kinsman redeemer, you first need to see yourself as being a Ruth, a Naomi, somebody who's unable to help yourself. And you need to see Jesus and you need to see his face towards you today, his face that is full of love and compassion, a desire to bring you out of where you are to a place of new life and abundant hope. What if God has allowed in the season, what if God has allowed in the season you to be emptied in some area so that you might be filled with him, that you might see with fresh eyes or maybe for the first time your need for grace and redemption that can only come through Jesus? Amen. Doesn't Jesus say, what does it profit a person if he loses the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? What if you've lost something in this season? lost a bit of this world and yet you have an opportunity to gain back a part of your soul. My prayer is that in the midst of the pain of this life for you friends when a glance shows hardship that you would gaze that you would gaze into that situation until you see hope break through that you would take your broken heart to Redeemer King Jesus who sees broken hearts as broken earth, as rich soil in which to plant the seeds of hope and that you might get to experience with joy the abundant life that he freely offers. I'm gonna pray for us in a second, but before I do, if you came in carrying a burden today, and especially if you came in bearing a burden alone, would you not leave bearing that burden alone? Would you refuse to suffer quietly anymore? Would you put the pride aside and say, this is my church family. I will come to them, whether it's something for you or somebody that you care about, and get prayer. There'll be somebody in either front corner of the room, same thing with Columbia. During this next song, during this next song, get up, come forward, say, I have a burden. Would you help me bear it? That is what we are to do, friends. That is to fulfill the law of Christ, bear each other's burdens together. Come and seek friendship in the midst of your pain. You won't regret it. Let's pray. God, thank you that you draw near to us in our pain. That you save the crushed in spirit. You draw near to the brokenhearted. Jesus, you refuse to forsake us, that you entered into our very pain, even going to the cross. And so we can come to you with our pain. You are the one who knows. 
who has compassion. And, and Jesus, thank you that the cross and your resurrection means that pain and death do not get the final word. That we look forward to a day where resurrection wins the day for all of us. But until then, Jesus, would we be your church? Would we be your church, the, the community, a family who comes alongside each other and bears burdens, refuses to forsake, stands by, is the persistent friend through the messes of life, because that's what you did for us. And as we do that, would that show a watching world just how fiercely you love us and are committed to us, that you will see this thing through to the end. We thank you for that hope. It is our anchor today. We rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Bridge family, let's stand as we respond and worship together. Prayer team is up front. If you'd like to pray with somebody, let's sing this out to the Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. For all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so. such a great morning and we're so glad you tuned in. Before we go, I want to encourage you to make the most of this time we're gathering online and take a next step, whatever God is stirring in your heart right now. We believe everyone has a next step to take and we would be honored to walk alongside you as you take that today. It's too important to wait. So make sure to fill out our digital connect card or just drop a comment or prayer request in the chat and our online hosts are there and ready to connect with you and pray with you right now. 
We're so thankful for the way technology has allowed us to do this together this morning, and we hope that Bridge Online is a resource for you in your growing walk with God or a step toward connecting to a local church family in person. You and I both are built for community, so I'd love to invite you to join us at one of our in-person services if you're in the Middle Tennessee area. But even if you're not, we'd love to help you find a church family near where you are, and you can continue your journey of being with Jesus and becoming like Him, all in the context of community. And last but not least, the mission of The Bridge and the life-changing ministry we get to do is fueled by your generosity and is helping us reach people with the gospel around our cities, nations, and all across the world. Giving is part of our worship to God because He has given so much to us, and it's an opportunity to give back to Him and witness His faithfulness through the little or much we can give. If you'd like to give today, there are easy ways for you to take that step. And if you've already given, thank you. We have one of the most generous church families, and we're so honored to be on mission together. One last time, at least for today, I'm so glad you've joined us this morning. We love you, and God loves you so much more. May we all be with Jesus and become more like him for the sake of the world. We'll see you next week.